Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming on kind of a gray day, but uh, it's, uh, it's warm and uh, inside here. We've got coffee, and I think it's going to be a very, very interesting morning. Um, first of all, w when we do public events, we always start with a brief safety announcement. I'm your responsible safety officer. It's my job to make sure that if we have, uh, have an episode uh, that I'll take care of all of you. I'm going to take care of the secretary first, but, but I am going to take care of all of you. Uh, the exits, if we have to exit, are right back here. And of course, at, at that end, the uh, stairwell going down to the street is closest to that door. Uh, if the problem's out in the front, we're going to go to the back and we'll go over to National Geographic. We have a mutual support arrangement with them. Uh, if the problem is uh, in the back, we're going to go out front. We'll go down to St. Matthew's Cathedral and I'll lead us in a feast of praise and thanksgiving that we all made it safely. Uh, but there's nothing going to happen. I don't want you to feel you have to be alarmed or anything. But we just want to be ready. Um, it's a real privilege uh, for, for us to be able to host today. And I especially want to say sincere thanks to United Health Group for making this series possible. You're very kind to, to do that, uh, to present uh, to the American policy community uh, a very important dimension that is too often neglected in America, and that's the state of America's commitment uh, to our veterans and their recovery. Uh, they have borne uh, the, the burden of service, and we have an obligation to make sure that they're cared for, they and their families. That's a, this is a, as deep a moral commitment as a country can have. You know, after the Civil War, one out of three dollars that the government spent for the next 10 years was for veterans, and it was, for, it was actually for um, artificial limbs. You know, it was that, it was such a horrific roar. And we're living through that now. We've had 12 years of war and the uh, Secretary has been coping with um, the, the incredible challenges that have come from this. It's, uh, we were talking, the, the Veterans Affairs hospital system is unique in that it combines not only physical care, but uh, spiritual care, because there's an awful lot of healing that has to take place in this sort of an environment. And, and he's doing a fabulous, fabulous job. Um, I, what I most admired on 9-11 was, uh, were the firemen that went rushing up the stairs when everybody else was running down. And then, in a way, that's what, uh, what Bob did when he was asked to come into the VA. Tremendous criticism at the time, and it, it, everybody was swarming in and trying to uh, score tactical points. And at the time when, when General Shinseki had to leave, uh, when the president turned to him, he said yes. Now that comes in character with his whole life story. He, was, uh, he was, uh, went to West Point, uh, graduated in the top 2% of his class, commissioned as an army officer, was a ranger. If, if any of you have been in the military, you know what that means. Uh, superb officer, and then went on to become an eminently successful uh, businessman at Procter Gamble. That's when we first met. So for him to come out of private life and into a time when America needs him, it is a, an enormous privilege for us to have him serve at this time, and it's a privilege for all of us to have him talk with us today. So could I ask you, uh, with your very warm applause, welcome the Secretary of the Veterans Affairs Administration, Bob McDonald. Thank you, John, for that very warm introduction. Um, uh, there was no question in my mind when I got the call from the White House that this was something I desperately wanted to do. What higher calling could there possibly be? And as John Lott rightly pointed out, when you think back to President Lincoln's charge in his second inaugural address to care for him who's born the battle, his widow and his survivors, we paraphrase that now given the large number of women veterans that we have to care for the, those who, um, who have served but also to care for their families. Uh, what an enormous um, privilege it is to be in this role. Um, I want to I give a few brief remarks so we can have plenty of time for questions and answers, so I'll get right to it. Uh, Dr. Harvey Feinberg, who some of you may know, the former president of the Institution of, uh, Institute of Medicine, said 
that the crisis that we had in 2014 around access, uh, Harvey saw it like this. He said, and I quote, VA can accomplish things now it never could have. And he was right. And that's exactly what we're doing, is we're trying to use this crisis to take advantage of this great opportunity that we have in the history of our department so we can better deliver outcomes for veterans and families. The potential here is enormous. VA is the largest integrated health care system in the United States. Over 1,200 health care facilities from large medical centers all the way to outpatient clinics. Over 350,000 employees, 25,000 physicians, the largest employer of nurses in the country, affiliations with over 1,800 academic institutions, and more. A single electronic health record across the entire enterprise, a lifetime relationship with 9 million patients, a psychosocial support for homeless patients, integrated mental health care, an organic pharmacy system, organic geriatric care. Besides health care, VA is a veterans resource for important non-medical determinants of health. These are services like career transition support, education services, vocational rehabilitation, fiduciary services, pension resources, disability compensation, home loan guarantees, insurance, and much, much more. In the private sector, if VA's budget were its revenue, in the private sector, VA would be Fortune 6, the sixth largest company in the country. The point is this. The failure that manifested itself in mid-2014 was a crisis, but it was also an opportunity, an opportunity for inspirational change to make VA better than it otherwise might have been. Our vision is a VA that's the number one, number one customer service organization in the federal government. That's our vision. And we're building a high performance organization to achieve that. That means an integrated, customer-centric enterprise leveraging VA's vast scope uh, and scale on behalf of every veteran, every single veteran we serve. Impossible? Impossible, you may ask? Well, let me share that the American Customer Satisfaction Index rated our National Cemetery Administration number one in customer service five times running. Better than Google, better than Lexus, better than Mercedes, better than anything in the United States. J.D. Power rated our mail order pharmacy best in the country in customer satisfaction six years running. We aim to achieve those kinds of successes across the entire enterprise in everything that we do. And here's how we're getting there. We are focusing on five strategies for the long term and 12 priorities for the short term or the near term. Our five long-term strategies, our My VA strategies, are about first, improving the veteran experience. Second, improving the employee experience. Third, achieving support services excellence. Fourth, establishing a culture of continuous improvement. Fifth, enhancing strategic partnerships. Those five broad strategies are about achieving customer service excellence. We call the strategy My VA, and that's exactly how we want veterans to see it. We want every veteran to see VA as their own, just like you would think about your cell phone, your, your smartphone, customized for your individual needs. We also want them to see VA as an organization they can be proud of, that they can trust, that they can count on, and that they can use for all of their needs. Now for the near term, we've taken those five strategies and we've distilled them to 12 breakthrough priorities for 2016. None of us will know what will happen with the leadership of the VA come January of 2017, so we thought it was important to put a stake in the ground for desirable outcomes by the end 
of this year, December. Eight of these 12 priorities are directly about improving service to veterans. For example, uh, improving the veteran experience, and I'll go into greater detail on that later. Increase access to health care. Three, improve community care. So if a veteran goes in the community for care, improve the quality of that care and also the reintegration back into VA. Four, deliver a unified veteran's experience. Five, modernize our contact centers. Six, improve the compensation and pension exam. This is typically the first time a veteran encounters the VA is when they go through this exam that determines their disability rating. Seven, develop a simplified appeals process. Right now we have a backlog of 440,000, 440,000 appeals that need to be dealt with. The law is 80 years old, it's archaic, it needs to be changed. Eight, continue to reduce veterans' homelessness. We've made great progress to date, 36% down since 2010, 50% uh, reduction in, uh, in veterans needing shelter uh, in the evening. So um, progress, but more to be done. Four of those 12 priorities are critical enablers. In other words, we have to get them done to enable the other eight. They include things like first improving the employee experience. Uh, it's no secret that the best customer service organizations in the world are also the best places to work. We have to, we have to create the conditions for employees to better care for veterans. Second, staff critical positions that are vacant. We have a lot of vacancies uh, throughout the VA. We have to change the way we staff positions and we're asking for new legislation that would allow us to pay competitively and hire competitively with the private sector. Three, we have to transform our office of information and technology. The scheduling system that got us into trouble in Phoenix dates to 1985. It's like working green screen MS-DOS. The financial management system by which we manage a budget of $185 billion is actually written in COBOL, a language that I wrote for the West Point mainframe computer in 1971. A very inflexible language. And number four, we want to transform our supply chain to increase our responsiveness and reduce operating costs. Right now, every one of our medical centers has its own supply chain. That's ridiculous. By consolidating the supply chain and simply having medical centers order uh, from an inventory that we already own, we can take advantage of our scale just like we have in the pharmacy uh, example that I gave earlier. Those four critical enablers are about reforming the internal system, giving employees the tools and the resources that they need to provide great service, and consistently delivering an exceptional veteran experience. Now we've shared uh, these with the House Veterans Affairs Committee, our authorizing committee in the House. The Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs invited us, uh, at my request, to a hearing to examine these 12 priorities. The President's proposed 2017 budget supports these priorities into the next year, and we're making progress. It's lost on some that in just the first 12 months after the access crisis, we completed 7 million more uh, health care appointments than we did in the same period the previous year, 7 million more. Two and a half million of those were within the VA. Four and a half million of those were within the community. Last fiscal year, we completed nearly two million more appointments than we did the year prior fiscal year. That was almost 57 million appointments inside VA and over 21 million appointments in the community. More than 97% of those appointments were within inside uh, 30 days of the clinically indicated or veterans preferred date. 1.4 million more than in the fiscal year 2014. Over the last 12 months, March of 2015 through this past February, veterans received 10% more authorizations for care in the community versus the same period last year. Over the last 12 months, we've completed 1.6 million more appointments than the year before. 
In February, we completed over 96% of appointments within 30 days of the clinically indicated or veteran preferred date. Average wait times, well, the average wait times right now are three days for mental care on average. Primary care is about five days on average and specialty care is about six days on average. Clinical workload is up more than 20% the last two years. A nearly 18% increase inside the VA, a 30%, 38% increase in the community. That's more than 7 million additional hours of care for veterans. We have people serving veterans more efficiently. We've increased our net onboard staff by over 18,000 the last year and a half. Over 6,300 more nurses, nearly 1,600 more physicians, almost 100 more psychiatrists, and 460 more psychologists. And we're expanding the clinical space that we use to treat veterans. In the last two years, we've added nearly 4 million square feet of new space. That means more access points for care. Veteran feedback tells us we're making some progress. About 90% of veterans using VetLink, that's our kiosk-based software, have told us that they were either completely satisfied or satisfied getting the appointment that they wanted. But too many told us they weren't satisfied. So we have a lot of work ahead of us to be the truly high-performing organization focused on customer service, veteran-centric, that we want to be. But that goal is in reach. As John said, uh, I worked at the Procter & Gamble Company for 33 years. I learned firsthand what it takes to create a high-performing organization and one that's customer-centric. Procter & Gamble serves 5 billion people on the planet every single day. At least one product is used by 5 billion people every single day. To be a high-performing organization, it requires a clear purpose, strong values, and enduring principles supporting sound strategies. We already have a clear purpose. We've talked about that. There is no higher purpose than caring for our nation's veterans. We have strong, admirable values. Many of us wear this eye care pin that represents those values. Integrity, commitment, advocacy, respect, and excellence. And we're doing everything we can to make sure all of our employees are focused on that mission and on those values. Every year, we do annual training to have people recommit themselves to that mission, to that value. Every speech I give, I always start with the mission and the values. That's how fundamental they are to guide our behavior. It takes strong, passionate leadership and effective management of robust systems and efficient processes to have a high-performance organization. We have a growing team of talent making innovative changes and creating opportunities for even greater progress. Twelve of our top 17 executives are new since I became secretary, 12 of 17. They're all uh, generally enthusiastic business leaders, experienced government and healthcare professionals, and many of them, if not most of them, are veterans. It takes the kind of responsive systems and processes we're building veteran-centric, but you have to do it by design. Here's an example. One of our breakthrough priorities is same-day access to primary care by the end of 2016. It's called My VA Access, focusing our staff, our tools, and our systems to give timely veteran-centric access to their health care. My VA Access means veterans seeking primary care get clinically appropriate health care encounters the very same day. This is already happening in about a quarter of our facilities. We want to get to 100% of our facilities by the end of the year. Now that could be a same day appointment with a primary care doctor. It could be a call from a nurse with medical advice. It could mean a telehealth or mental telehealth encounter. It could be a secure message or a prescription refill or a walk-in to a clinic or emergency facility. And it takes world-class collaboration and strategic partnerships, vast networks working together to serve veterans. That's why we've enabled a network, a national network of 54 community veterans engagement boards. 
These boards are designed to leverage community assets, not just VA assets, to meet local veteran needs. Our goal is to have 100 of these by the end of the year. That's why we're capitalizing on strategic partnerships with external organizations and leveraging their goodwill, their resources, and their expertise. Our partners these days include respected organizations like IBM, Philips, Johnson & Johnson, Amazon, LinkedIn, Coursera, Google, Walgreens, the YMCA, the Elks, United Healthcare, the Penn Fed Foundation, academic institutions, the very best medical schools in the country, other federal agencies, and many more. It's why we're working collaboratively with world-class institutions like USAA, Cleveland Clinic, Wegmans, Starbucks, Marriott, Ritz-Carlton, NASA, Kaiser Permanente, Hospital Corporation of America, Virginia Mason, the Department of Defense, and GSA, among many others. It's why we're consulting and listening to experts' good advice on our transformation. I set up a My VA Advisory Committee. We call it MVAC. Uh, it's a diverse group of business leaders, many of whom are veterans, medical professionals, experienced government executives, and veteran advocates. We meet once a quarter. They give us advice. We follow their advice. And we are very transparent with them as to what we have done well and what we need to do better. For employees serving veterans, growing a high performance organization means intellectually equipping more and more teams to dramatically improve care and service delivery to veterans. We have to engage our employees to make the changes that they think we need to make. That's why we developed our Leaders Developing Leaders program, LDL in short, and it's helping us do this. Think of LDL as a continuous enterprise-wide growth spreading best practices across VA. We work with Noel Tishi, professor at the University of Michigan, mentor to Jack Welch, author of 14 books on business practices, and uh, the originator of GE Crotonville, their learning university to help us. We launched LDL last November with 450 senior field leaders and over 9,000 are already trained. We'll get to over 12,000 by the end of the year. This is cascading training. We train the top 450, they then go train their subordinates and so forth until we get to the housekeeper who cleans the room in the hospital. Our goal, and the goal of any high performance organization, is when President Kennedy asks the guy sweeping the floor at the Space Center, what is he doing? He says, I'm putting a man on the moon. We need every employee to understand how what they do every single day leads back to that vision, that strategy of the enterprise. We're training employees on advanced business techniques that drive responsive and innovative change. Private sector experts are teaching employees cutting edge business skills like Lean Six Sigma and like human-centered design. Human-centered design and Lean are helping employees reshape the compensation and pension process that veterans find burdensome. We're working to give every employee clear performance expectations, continuous feedback, and the performance management systems that will encourage continuous improvement and excellence. And it means executive performance ratings and bonuses reflect performance, performance, veteran outcomes, employee surveys, and 360 degree feedback, which we train as part of our LDL training. We're committed to doing everything we can for veterans, advancing on all these lines and many others. But important priorities for transformational change require congressional action. The President's 2017 budget request is another tangible sign of his steadfast devotion to veterans and his commitment to transform the VA. The Senate Appropriations Committee approved a budget nearly equal to the President's request, and for that we're thankful. The House markup, however, proposed a reduction of $1.5 billion. So let's be clear. That reduction will hurt veterans and it will impede some critical initiatives necessary to transform VA into the high-performing organization that veterans deserve. So we're encouraging Congress to fully fund the VA at the requested level. More than 100 legislative proposals for VA are in the President's 2017 budget and 2018 advanced appropriations request. 
Over 40 are new this year. They require congressional action. Some are absolutely critical to maintaining our ability to purchase non-VA care. In mid-March, I testified to Congress about the most important requirements to help us serve veterans better. We need Congress's help modernizing and clarifying VA's purchase care authorities. Above all else, this needs to get done to ensure a strong foundation for veterans' access to care in the community. We need Congress to help streamlining VA's care in the community. We have seven different programs for providing care in the community. Each one has their own specifications, their own criteria, their own repayment rates. Not surprisingly, it's complicated for VA employees to administer and incredibly complicated for veterans to understand. Last October, we submitted a plan to consolidate and simplify the overwhelming number of different programs and improve access to VA care in the community. That was last October. It's now May. We need Congress to enact legislation that will allow us to better compete with the private sector to get the best medical professionals to choose the VA. A medical center director's salary is currently capped at the Title V limit of about $157,000 they can earn two to three times that much in the private sector. That means flexibility on the 80-hour pay period limit for certain medical professionals and compensation reforms for network and hospital directors. Likewise, we need to treat healthcare career executives more like their private sector counterparts. That means expanding Title 38 hiring authority to VHA senior executive level medical center directors, vision directors, and other healthcare executive positions. Then we could hire these employees more quickly with flexible competitive salaries, and they'd operate under stronger accountability processes and policies. We have to be more responsive to veterans' emerging needs, so we're asking for modest flexibility to overcome artificial funding restrictions on veterans' health care and benefits. I have over 70 line items of budget that I cannot move money from one line item to the other, even if it's to give care to veterans. And we've urged ambitious action on our disability claim appeals system. We simply can't serve veterans well unless we come together and make big changes in the appeals process. It's a heavy lift. But in the past few weeks, we've had a series of breakthrough meetings on appeals with veteran service organizations other veterans advocates, and congressional staffers. Through these extraordinary sustained efforts, in early April, VA provided to Congress a comprehensive appeals modernization legislative proposal that veteran advocates designed with us. I believe Congress is responding. On the Senate side, Chairman Johnny Isaacson, in partnership with Ranking Member Dick Blumenthal, just last Thursday released the Veterans First Act a large omnibus that includes many of the legislative solutions we've been urging. However, important elements that will benefit veterans are still missing, including the comprehensive approach to consolidate community care and the breakthrough appeals reform that veterans need. Last week, a coalition of veteran service organizations wrote to Chairman Isaacson, Ranking Member Blumenthal, to urge action on the appeals reform package. On the House side, leaning Democrat on the House panel that handles appeals reform has introduced as her own bill, H.R. 5083, which includes the changes we are seeking. We'll continue to press in the weeks ahead. Our window of opportunity won't be open indefinitely. This Congress, with today's VA leadership team, can enable all of these transformational changes and more for veterans then we can all look back on this year as the year we turn the corner for veterans. Those are a few points about our progress and our challenges. Now some have argued that VA can best serve veterans by shutting down VA health care altogether. They argue that closing VA is the kind of bold transformation veterans and their families need, want, and deserve. I suspect that proposal serves some parties pretty well. But it's not transformational. It's more along the lines of dereliction. It doesn't serve veterans well, and it doesn't sit well with me as a veteran. President Reagan gave veterans a seat at the table of our national affairs nearly three decades ago. 
My VA is about keeping veterans at the table in control of how, when, and where they wish to be served. Thank you for sharing this time with me this morning. I look forward to your questions and your comments. Thank you. Um, Secretary, that was uh, both informative and inspirational. And Thanks, uh, I think all of us are very grateful to have you know, have uh, your remarkable leadership right now. It's, uh, it really was exceptional. Let, let me follow up just to ask a little more detail about something you mentioned. You, you mentioned that the VA is not able to capture its purchasing power because it doesn't have a unified purchasing system. Um, how, how, did, how did this happen? You would, I would have thought we would have had that. And what can you do about that? Well, the headline of that, John, is, is, is I came to the VA, what I discovered, many things that uh, business had done over the last couple of decades had somehow averted VA. Whether it's Lean Six Sigma, we have pockets where we're outstanding at Lean Six Sigma, Palo Alto being an example. Um, Human-centered design, how companies like Procter & Gamble and Disney design delightful experiences for their customers. Um, Consolidated supply chain to take advantage of scale. Uh, these things had all eluded the VA. How did it happen that way? Well, over time, uh, VA has been a loose confederation of independent entities. Um, that's, that's outstanding. You want that. As a business leader, you want that in order to foster innovation. But once the innovation is identified, the innovation then needs to be put across mm -hmm. the enterprise. And uh, that's one of the things we're working very hard on now, which is identifying those current best approaches in each, in each one of our medical centers, and then uh, spreading those across the entire enterprise. You know, it, it, I have friends who know the VA far better than do I say that it's, it's really hospitals flying in formation. It's not a unified system. And I'm told that the, that the, you know, the IT environment in, in, from one center to the next will vary dramatically. Uh, what, what can you do about that? Well, what we're do doing, and, and, and this is what you do in any business, is you identify the hard points and the soft points, the things you want consistent throughout the operation, the things you don't want. Uh, and a, a, a metaphor or an analogy would be um, uh, Pantene. Uh, any of you use Pantene, a uh, hair care product, uh, the, if you looked at the bottle in Japan, you would assume it was the same product. So there would be some Japanese graphics on it, but the na brand name would be the same, the color of the package would be the same, the shape of the package would be the same. Um, so there's some things you want to be consistent throughout the operation. Um, in contrast to that, though, a Japanese hair is twice the radius of Caucasian hair. So if you remember your geometry at all, that means you have six times the surface area, two times pi, six times the surface area. So Japanese hair is like this, a Caucasian hair is like this. Obviously, the product in Japan has to have a lot more conditioning ingredients than the product uh, in the United States. So you want to decide what are the hard points, what's going to be consistent, what are the soft points, what are you going to allow to be different. And particularly, you want those differences because they foment innovation. And that innovation is critical to improving the way you improve lives. So for example, we want to have an electronic medical record mm -hmm. that's consistent across the enterprise. But right now, we have over 140 versions of that electronic medical record, which means every time we update it, we have to update it over 140 times. Why not go to a standard electronic medical record, have that consistency, and then allow some innovation to find out how we advance that electronic medical record. Those are the things that Dr. David Shulkin, our Undersecretary for Health, are about. I was thrilled to recruit him. It took me eight months to recruit him. Uh, he's run medical systems uh, before. He knows how to do this, and we're thrilled to have him on board. Changing out uh, you know, an IT ecosystem uh, in such a vast enterprise is going to be very challenging. It's going to take a quite firm central direction, I would think. It is very challenging. Um, 
In fact, uh, many people, even when I approached this transformation, they said, you know, you're not going to be there that long. Why, why do you want to take this on? Why not just improve the things you can improve in short term? And my point of view, uh, you know, I, I go back to the West Point Cadet Prayer, which has animated my life. You know, help me to choose the harder right rather than the easier wrong. This is the harder right. Um, knowing IT was a struggle, uh, again, it took us too long, but we recruited Laverne Council, who headed IT at Johnson & Johnson and at Dell. She knows how to do this. Um, and she's uh, transforming our IT organization, which is um, a dramatic change. Uh, previously, we always uh, thought about servers and hardware. Now we're thinking about the cloud. Previously, we thought about um, programming, uh, creation of software using um, uh, a waterfall approach. Uh, now we, we iterate uh, over time. So these are practices that the private sector has been using for years. We're bringing them to government, and we're bringing the leaders with business experience to government to create a better uh, result for veterans. I, I was at the Defense Department for a time, and was startled at how little integration there is between the Defense Department, health system, and the VA. Could you, how would you characterize working relations now, and what do you think is possible? Well, we've, we've uh, opened up the tent to everybody, uh, including the Department of Defense. Um, we know we can't do this by ourselves. We also know there's no reason for the taxpayer to pay for redundant systems when they're unnecessary. So, uh, and, and this even started before my tenure. So we have several um, operations where we share those operations with the Department of Defense. We discover that in a sense, if we're a sine curve, the Department of Defense is an inverse sine curve. Uh, after the war ends, we pick up the, the veterans who served uh, during the time of war. So we have joint facilities. We have joint facilities in San Antonio, in Anchorage, Alaska, uh, in Great Lakes. We have a joint facility with the Navy. Uh, and those joint facilities are synergistic. They're synergistic because we get a larger number of doctors, num larger number of trained doctors. And the Department of Defense would say they're great for them because it's very hard to be a proficient doctor when all you're caring for are 19 to 22 year old uh, soldiers who are in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. uh, they love the chronic and acute problems that our veterans have. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I, this is a personal comment. I've, uh, I've always felt that the Defense Department has not done a very good job of how it's taken care of people when they leave the department. We're great about recruiting, and I think we rather default and just assume that's VA. And, uh, it, shame on us. It, we should have a higher priority to well, work with Well, I, I have to tell you, um, Chuck Hagel and now Ash Carter have made this a very high priority. 250,000 service members are leaving the service this year. Mm -hmm. And we've created a program called TAP, Transition Assistance Program, where actually we've pushed that uh, upstream. So it starts Great. about 120 days before the person gets out. Mm -hmm. I've attended TAP programs and I've spoke at them where the commanding officer of that unit actually gets up and says, it's my responsibility to help you transition successfully to the private sector. I even did a session with non-commissioned officers. You know, the, the hardcore of the hardcore is saying, we're gonna take responsibility for your successful transition. We give them their medical exam, we get them their benefits, we get them signed up for everything that they deserve, and then we have a job fair. So hopefully they can even get a job before they actually um, leave the service. Very different than when I left the military in well, 1980. Well, that's splendid. I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. We're working very hard at this. We Sec have to. Yes, Secretary, um, we're coming on a transition in government. Uh, it's a little scary where it's going. Uh, 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 but it worries me always when this happens because you get tremendous momentum that's growing up around a talented leader and we don't know who comes next. Could you tell us about your thinking of transition? How are you thinking about making, continuing this momentum? Well, we, that's the reason we put those 12 priorities in place. We want to create irreversible momentum. It's, it's my belief that if you teach people properly and you train them properly and they see the benefits of what you're doing, then they will carry it on whether or not you're there. In fact, one of my 10 leadership beliefs is 
how the organization performs while you're there isn't really what's important. What's important is how the organization performs right. when you're not there. Right. Right. Jim right. Collins, my friend Jim Collins likes to say, did you build a clock or did you tell time? Uh, we're trying to build a clock, mm -hmm. and that's what those five strategies, those 12 priorities, are about. that's what the training is about, so that um, who would ever follow um, hopefully would keep it going. Uh, these, are, these are pretty simple business principles, business processes. Uh, they're tried and true. They've made companies like Procter & Gamble admired companies. Um, we should apply them to benefit our veterans. Yes. Okay, folks, we've got uh, camera, we've got microphones, so let's start over. General Taguba, I'm so glad to see you. I haven't seen you in a little while. The microphone right there. I'm not sure, is it, is it on? I'm not sure. Should we just slide that, slide that up? Or do we need a new microphone? Let's, do we got another microphone? Let's, let's get it over here real quick. And, and okay, everybody see me? Yes, sir. Mr. Secretary, thank you for uh, coming and presenting your, uh, your case as far as improving veterans care access. Uh, two things. One is the appeals process, and I know you're working on that. And I don't want to take the thunder from Mr. Almeida, 99 years old, who has been waiting to have his appeal approved, and I'm sure I'm going to have him ask the question in regards to where that is today. Um, and uh, that appeals process is about uh, identifying himself as someone who fought during World War II. My other uh, topic, and I, I'll address to you, is accessibility and availability of resources to include outsourcing, uh, I'm sorry, outreaching to veterans. I'm an AARP community ambassador on caregiving. Uh, just recently, uh, VA had a good program for post 9-11 caregiving program. Uh, almost 500 million, 20,000 have supported that so far that they're enrolled. It's the only program that provides stipends to caregivers. There are 43 million caregivers in the United States today, which sucks about $500 billion of their own funds to provide caregiving. Uh, and I've gone across the country, and one of those issues about caregiving support is a lot of veterans, not post 9-11, don't know anything about your program. Uh, I've gone to San Francisco, spoken to four venues last week. Uh, Governor McAuliffe's uh, conference just this past two days on aging. Uh, they didn't know anything about veterans caregiving support, uh, especially for your World War II veterans. The reason why I said that is because your staff are never, are never present in those venues. And did I'm very critical them? about that. Uh, did you for, invite them? Uh, yes. And uh, they didn't, but let me, and let they me give you come. an example, sir. In San Francisco today, uh, we provided at least some contacts for AARP to get them involved in caregiving. We're slowly partnering in that regard. So I was asked to provide some information, and that goes back to my own father, uh, Sergeant First Class Tomas Taguba, a, a death march survivor. For 11 years, he was not seen by VA, nor anybody cared about him, and he passed away. So my question is, if in fact it's improving, and I know it's hard you know, when there's a gap between what you're providing today and what's in the community, uh, uh, I think it's vastly important that when we say care for our veterans, a veteran has families as well. So it's oh, very no important. There's no question about yeah. that. Okay, let me, we're gonna have, we have several questions, so we'll I'm, have to move yes, on. Yeah, I'm ahead. a big advocate of, um, of caregiving. Uh, I work very closely with Elizabeth Dole and the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, which is a fantastic organization. Uh, I was at the Easter Seals celebration uh, two weeks ago. Easter Seals does a great job with us as our partner in caregiving. The important thing that you uh, mentioned that I want to highlight is the law now says we can help caregivers who are not post 9-11 caregivers. It seems rather unfair that if you're a pre 9-11 caregiver, you can't get the VA help. Mm -hmm. In the new omnibus bill that we've worked on with the Senate, um, pre 9-11 caregiving is part of that bill. Uh, so that's another opportunity for us to get out there and make sure the veterans uh, sign up for the caregiving that's there. Another important point about caregiving is if you want to know what's going to go wrong with American medicine, 
look at the VA, where is the largest integrated system, we see the problems that American medicine will see before American medicine sees them. Caregiving is a huge issue for us. That's why I spend so much time on it. Uh, and it's going to be a bigger issue for the American population as the population ages. So I'm, I'm thankful that you brought that up. Please uh, invite us to all of the caregiving events that you give so I can make sure people are there. Uh, just send me the schedule, bob.mcdonald at va.gov, and I will get them there. Okay, uh, right back here. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, you lady, you ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Secretary McDonald, thank you so much for your time. My name is Kelly Madrick. I'm a reporter at CQ. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about something you mentioned in your address um, as to care in the community. Many in Congress kind of see the future of VA healthcare as one that relies much more on care in the community. And I sense the ultimate goal, and some, some members have told me that the idea is to kind of unravel the reliance on VA facilities. I'm thinking specifically of Senator John McCain's recent proposal to dramatically expand the eligibility of the VA Choice Program. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you see care in the community kind of um, dovetailing with your efforts at VA and in the future, in a future where there are plenty more veterans coming and seeking care at the VA, um, are we going to have to rely more on private facilities? And you know, okay, I, I've, that's fine. I've got okay. I've got too many people with questions. Okay, go ahead, um, Kelly. We we believe in a a um, a network of of care for veterans, uh, a network of high quality care that involves both VA uh, doctors, VA facilities and care in the community. So we believe in a combination of both. The question is, is what's the right balance? Uh, as I said, of that seven million more appointments we had, two and a half million were within VA, four and a half million were outside the VA. Uh, we don't know exactly what that balance will be, but we know that there will be that, that balance and we're working to achieve that by creating a, a network. That, that plan I told you about that we gave to Congress last October, that consolidated plan, if you look at that, uh, it describes the network we're trying to create and the balance that we're trying to create between that. Uh, we'll take the, in the, the second, yeah, right there. The microphone's coming right around to you. Thanks. Hello, sir. Thank you for being here. My name's uh, Dan Vasquez, Air Force veteran. Uh, what do you say to veterans like myself who, uh, when we're working with a veteran support organization on the VA claim, the support organization is telling us uh, don't expect any help from the VA on certain uh, medical issues that you didn't complain often enough about in the military? Because uh, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't understand the question, Dan. Okay. I can't uh, hear you. I'm working with a veterans uh, support organization yes. who's helping me with my VA claim. And yes. I know there are other veterans that are like me on this. They're saying, don't expect any help from the VA on these issues that you're listing here, because while you're active duty, you didn't complain often enough about them. Now, when we're active duty, the bind we're in is if we complain too much, we may yeah, get pushed yeah, out of the I service. Got I got it. Yeah, my, my, um, first of all, by law, we're required to give the, ben the benefit of the doubt to the veteran. So for example, let's say you were like me, you were in the 82nd Airborne Division, and you've jumped out of an airplane with a parachute 50 times, and you never went to sick call, but today you're missing the three lower discs in your back. Uh, you can still you know, get that claim um, uh, made successfully. Um, you just have to have the proof that that's actually what you went through. And then what we do is we look at other veterans in similar situations to, um, to triangulate uh, whether or not the claim is valid. You know, we, we've got a dual responsibility. Our responsibility is obviously to care for the veteran, to advocate for the veteran. We also have a responsibility to taxpayers, and we've got to balance those, those priorities. If you have trouble with your claim, um, just email me, bob.mcdonald at va.gov, and I'd be happy to look into it. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, there's a microphone coming, right? Hold, hold on. By the way, please, no personal appeals. You can come Good morning, up Secretary. Later. This is a public event. We have met with you and your staff several times. Do you remember me? Yes, sir. I, 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 don't, I can't remember exactly when we met. Your decision for my denial 
as a veteran of World War II, was vacated by the decision of the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claim, dated March 31st, 2014. We are now 2016, and you have not rendered any decision on my appeal. What is your decision now? Now, Maraming Salama Po. I was granted citizenship way back in 1996 because I am a veteran. Yeah, we have. And we I had my health care access card. Sir, sir, I mean, I, I, I'm going to interrupt you to say this is a public event for policy purpose, not a private appeal. And I'd ask you to come and the secretary has told you how you can reach him. Please do it that way. Please take the microphone from him. I, we're, I can't have you interrupt this meeting anymore. I'm sorry. I'm totally I'm sorry, I can't have you interrupt the meeting any longer, sir. There are, there are uh, people who served in the military, in the Philippine military during World War II. We rely on the Philippine government to certify that those people served in the Philippine military uh, in conjunction with the United States. Okay, let's, uh, I'm looking for policy questions. I'm not looking for personal appeals, all right? Hands up if you have policy. All right, uh, Jeremy Bash. We got a microphone coming down to you. Thanks for being here, Mr. Secretary. My name is Jeremy Bash. Uh, served at the Department of Defense. Thanks to United for sponsoring this. What's the future of technology in providing access to the VA health system uh, for for veterans and their families? Yeah, that's a great point, Jeremy. Um, technology plays a huge role. Again, as I said earlier, if you, if you want to look at the future of American medicine, look at the VA. Um, last year we had, uh, I think it was over 700,000 telehealth appointments. Uh, we're finding that telehealth is, is a critical component to serving veterans in rural areas. One of the problems in American medicine is many states don't have medical schools. As a result, many states, particularly the rural ones, are missing the primary care doctors they need, are missing the mental health professionals that they need. So we employ telehealth as a way to contact veterans. And actually we're finding in the mental health area, veterans prefer a, a mental health appointment sitting in their living room using telehealth, during a Wi-Fi connection, than they do coming to a facility. So uh, this is an important space, one that I think is the future of medicine, uh, given the dearth of doctors that we have and uh, one, one where we're, we're, we're on the cutting edge of innovation. Uh, lady in the very back, uh, policy question? Okay. Hi, thank you. My name's uh, Nicole Lagrisco. I'm with Federal News Radio. Um, the Congress has indicated that accountability is gonna be the key to whatever legislation they pass. Uh, I think the House and Senate thinking on this issue is pretty different. What can you tell us about the conversations that you're having with them about this accountability piece? Are you willing to sort of budge in your thinking about accountability to get some of these appeals process pieces in there, the community care consolidation? What can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, accountability is obviously very important. I mean, when you run a company the size of the Procter & Gamble company, for example, obviously accountability is important, just like when you run the VA, accountability is important. Since I've become uh, secretary, we have uh, terminated about, oh, probably over 2,900 uh, employees. Uh, we've proposed accountability actions. Um, but we found that the system hasn't been uh, terribly helpful, so we've worked with the Senate and the House to, um, in this new omnibus legislation, uh, bipartisan, supported by both the Democrats and the Republicans in the Senate on our committee, uh, to redo the accountability system. Part of that is taking advantage of Title 38, uh, as I talked about earlier, uh, which would improve recruiting, improve compensation, and improve accountability. Uh, uh, yes, please, stand up and then he'll bring the microphone. Uh, thank you, Secretary Bob. My name is Fred Coral, and with a services able veteran owned small business. And I want to bring to your attention a potential significant cost savings in the disability claims area. The um, medical disability claims process has resulted in significant backlogs. And we began looking at um, improvements and process improvements. And one of the areas that we, we looked at was electronic health records and the proliferation of those records and the treatment by, uh, of veterans in the private sector. 
And many, many of those records now are accessible electronically. And we felt that that might be a way to substantiate medical disability claims and improve the process. So we went to the, the VBA and we had a meeting last December with two team partners. One's a company called Cerner and the other is a company called Secure Exchange Solutions and did a live demonstration of accessing medical documentation in a case study of a veteran to demonstrate how this documentation could be obtained. It was an echocardiogram for a, um, a ischemic heart disease problem. And about two weeks later, we got a letter back from the VA saying, this is interesting, we've already got a contract to do that work. So we looked it up, it was an $8 million contract for paper document gathering. Last, in March, the VA awarded a uh, medical disability examination, con 12 contracts, which is net needed, I'm not making that point, with a ceiling of $6.8 billion. The contract for document recovery to substantiate claims is $8 million. There's a significant opportunity to save hundreds of millions of dollars if the VA can obtain existing medical clinical documentation to substantiate these claims instead of having the veteran go get a, an opinion, a, 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 an examination from a contractor to substantiate that claim. Fred, why don't you email me that, just what you said, bob.mcdonald bob at va.gov and I'll take a look at it. Super, appreciate okay, that. I have time for just for one last question, right in the back, because the secretary has to leave. Yep. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. Phil Carter from yeah, CNAS. Yeah, Phil, how are you? Good, sir. Um, so demography is destiny, and you've sketched out a vision for the VA in a 2016, but as you know, the veterans population is going to change a lot over the next 10 to 20 years. Sketch out a vision of what the VA looks like 20 years down the road. The vets population goes from 22 million to 15 million. How does the VA make that leap to the future? Yeah, uh, Phil raises a great point. Let me give you some background that Phil knows that probably the audience doesn't know. Uh, the problems in 2014 in the VA uh, were not because of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, it would be common sense to think it was because we've been fighting wars for 12 years. The, the issues were because of the aging of the veteran population. In 1975, when I graduated from West Point, there were um, 2 million veterans over the age of 65. In 2017, there'll be 10 million veterans over the age of 65, a five times increase in 40 years. That's an enormous change. What happens when you have that aging of the veteran population is you get more disability claims. So we've gone from roughly 940,000 in 2009 to 1.6 million in uh, 2015, 16. Uh, and then number of medical issues per claim has skyrocketed from roughly one and a half to about six, five to six. So the aging of the population has become more controlling to the supply and demand of VA than has the number of veterans. So the, the, the issue I fight all the time is, well, the number, total number of veterans is declining, as Phil rightly points out. Um, but that's not what's really controlling. What's controlling is the aging of the population. So again, I said, if you wanna see what's potentially going to go wrong with American medicine, look at the VA. Um, this is what's happening to the American population, is we're aging, but we're not really getting ready for that. So if we don't build a system today, and Phil, I'll get to your question, if we don't build a system today, 40 years from now, when the Iraq and Afghanistan veterans age, they won't have, we won't have the capable system to care for them, and we'll be back to uh, another crisis. So the total number of veterans is declining. The system I foresee in the future, Phil, is, is, is a network of pre-approved providers, both inside the VA, outside the VA, uh, an electronic medical record that is consistent nationally with the same criteria so the record can follow the patient whether they're inside the VA or outside the VA. I see a much higher number of female veterans, uh, as many as 20% by the time we get out uh, another 20 years or so. Um, and uh, that means we're gonna have to have gynecologists. Uh, we now provide uh, pediatric care for the first week after birth. 
uh, it means a whole host of diverse things that we're going to have to do that we didn't have to do in the past. I mean, remember, 60% of our buildings are over 50 years old. Some were actually built with communal uh, living space. We're trying to change that, but it's very hard to get that construction money, money from Congress. Um, so we're going to have to be dealing with both genders, and uh, we're going to have to be dealing with an inside and outside seamless um, uh, approach. I'm hoping that uh, over time we can continue to run this large government organization like a business, because in a sense uh, that's what it is, and focus on our customers. So wherever a veteran wants to go, whatever they want, whatever they want to be seen, whatever they want to be seen for, if they want paper notices, if they want email or text messages, I think we need to be able to provide it. Phil, I'm not sure I got to all your question, but it gave me an opportunity to talk a little bit about what we see. The, the, the secretary, uh, he has to leave uh, because we, he's got to go to a meeting. I think we all should say thank you for an extraordinary performance, and we look forward to having you again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you John.